Prior to 1945, the promotion and protection of human rights was largely an afterthought in global politics. Instead, the principle of non-interference in the domestic affairs of states was the central pillar of international law. Individuals were viewed only as citizens or subjects of the state, not as actors in their own right. The shock of the two world wars, and in particular the atrocities of the Holocaust, sparked a global effort to change this. And so in this video, we're going to explore the landscape of the international human rights regime that emerged as a result. That story begins in 1948, when in one of its earliest and arguably most important actions, the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights without opposition. The Declaration sets out a comprehensive framework of universally recognized human rights that apply to all individuals regardless of their nationality, ethnicity, religion, or other status. The Universal Declaration is not legally binding in and of itself, but it has served as the foundation for the development of binding international human rights treaties and has influenced national constitutions and laws around the world. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is important for several reasons. First, the Declaration recognizes the inherent dignity and worth of every human being. It proclaims that all individuals are born free and equal in dignity and rights. This acknowledgement of human dignity forms the moral and philosophical basis for the protection of human rights and emphasizes the importance of treating all individuals with respect and fairness. The Declaration is also applicable to all people, regardless of their nationality, race, gender, religion, or other characteristics. It affirms that human rights are not privileges granted by governments, but are inherent to all individuals simply by virtue of being human. This universality ensures that all individuals are entitled to the same fundamental rights and freedoms, irrespective of where they live. The Universal Declaration also provides a comprehensive and inclusive framework of human rights. It covers a wide variety of basic rights, providing a holistic approach that recognizes the interconnectedness and interdependent nature of human rights, and the idea that the full realization of human rights requires addressing all aspects of being human. The Declaration reflects a global consensus on the fundamental rights and freedoms that should be protected and respected. It has been endorsed by countries from diverse cultural, political, and legal backgrounds, serving as a common reference point and sets international standards for human rights. As such, it provides a basis for dialogue, cooperation, and accountability among nations, and offers a framework for assessing human rights practices of governments. Finally, the Declaration has served as a source of inspiration and motivation for human rights defenders, activists, and organizations around the world. It provides a rallying point for those who want to work to promote and protect human rights and is regularly invoked in struggles for justice, equality, and freedom around the world, serving, at least in principle, as a tool to hold governments accountable for their human rights obligations. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is comprised of 30 articles, which together outline the fundamental rights that belong to all people. Article 1 declares that all people are free and equal in dignity and rights. Article 2 proclaims the universality of rights afforded under the document, declaring that they should be guaranteed regardless of race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, natural or so national or social origin, property, birth, or status. Article 3 provides the right to life, liberty, and security of person, while Article 4 prohibits slavery or servitude. Article 5 prohibits torture, cruel, inhumane, or degrading punishments. And Article 6 guarantees recognition before the law, which is complemented by Article 7's provision for the equal protection and equality before the law, supported by the right to effective remedy in national courts provided by Article 8. Article 9 prohibits arbitrary arrest, detention, and exile. Article 10 guarantees fair and public trials by an independent court. Article 11's two provisions establish a defendant's presumption of innocence and prohibits ex post facto laws. Article 12 establishes a right to privacy. Article 13 provides for the freedom of movement and travel within and between countries, while Article 14 recognizes the right to seek asylum. Article 15 provides the right to a nationality, and Article 16 guarantees the right to marriage and protects against non-consensual marriage. 
Article 17 establishes the right to own property, and Article 18 guarantees freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Article 19 provides for freedom of expression and opinion, and Article 20 establishes the right of freedom of assembly and association. Article 21 is interesting because it essentially establishes the right to a democratic political system defined by universal and equal suffrage operationalized through a secret ballot, and provides that popular sovereignty is the basis of legitimate government authority. Article 22 establishes broad rights to social security and protection of economic, social, and cultural rights. Article 23's four clauses establish a right to work without discrimination, as well as the right to join unions, while Article 24 guarantees the right to rest and leisure. Article 25 establishes the right to a reasonable standard of living and affords special provisions for mothers and children. Article 26 broadly establishes the right to an education. Article 27 guarantees the right to participate in cultural life, to enjoy the arts, and to share in the benefits of scientific advances. Article 28 recognizes that the protection of the rights afforded under the Declaration requires an international order supportive of those rights, while Article 29 broadly recognizes the importance of individual participation in the protection of human rights. And finally, Article 30 is intended to prevent states from using one right afforded under the Declaration to abrogate another protected right. Taken together, the rights afforded under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights are intended to provide a moral and legal framework for governments, civil society, and individuals to uphold human dignity, equality, and justice. Indeed, as Eleanor Roosevelt, the U.S. representative to the United Nations responsible for negotiating the Declaration and one of the lead authors of the document, said at the time of its adoption, in giving our approval to the Declaration today, it is of primary importance that we keep clearly in mind the basic character of the document. It is not a treaty. It is not an international agreement. It is not and does not purport to be a statement of law or legal obligation. It is a declaration of basic principles, of human rights and freedoms, to be stamped with the approval of the General Assembly by a formal vote of its members and to serve as a common standard of achievement for all peoples of all nations. And this is an important observation. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a treaty and is not legally binding on its signatories, but it nevertheless provides a foundation for modern international human rights regimes in several important ways. First, many of the principles and rights articulated in the document have made their way into national laws and the constitutions of signatory states through a process referred to as incorporation. In this way, the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights often become legally enforceable through domestic or national court systems. Second, many of the elements of the Declaration are integrated into other international treaties and conventions, which are legally binding on their signatories. These include the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, both of which we'll return to shortly. The principles of the Declaration are also elaborated on in other binding international treaties, including the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, the International Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, and the United Nations Convention among, Against Torture, among others. Finally, even though it is not generally considered legally binding on its signatories, Many international legal scholars nevertheless consider the Declaration Jus Cogens, a preemptory principle accepted by the international community as a norm from which no derogation is permitted. This principle is sometimes referred to as customary international law, which can be and often is referenced by the International Court of Justice as legally binding on states. As previously mentioned, two of the primary international conventions that operationalize the principles outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in a manner that is legally enforceable on signatory states are the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. While the two covenants are complementary and interconnected, they are nevertheless separate documents with different signatories, scopes, and functions. Both treaties came into effect in 1976. 
The Civil and Political Rights Treaty today has 173 party states. The notable non-party states include China and Cuba, both of which signed the treaty but never ratified it, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, which are both non-signatories, and North Korea, which is the only country that has withdrawn from the agreement. The Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Treaty has 171 party states. The United States signed but never ratified the treaty, while some 20 countries, including Botswana, Mozambique, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates, never signed the treaty. The Civil and Political Rights Covenant focuses on civil and political rights, emphasizing the rights related to individual freedom and participation in political and public life. It includes rights such as the right to life, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, the right to fair, a fair trial, and the right to political participation. These are often seen as negative rights or freedom rights because they involve freedom from interference by the state or other individuals. They are rights that generally require the state to refrain from taking certain actions that may limit individual liberties. By contrast, the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Covenant focuses, not surprisingly, on economic, social, and cultural rights, highlighting the rights related to economic and social well-being. It includes rights such as the right to work, the right to education, the right to health care, the right to an adequate standard of living, and the right to cultural participation. These are collectively often referred to as positive rights or entitlement rights because they involve the state's obligation to actively provide resources, services, or conditions necessary for individuals to enjoy their economic, social, and cultural rights. They require, in other words, the state to take affirmative action to ensure the realization of these rights. The Civil and Political Rights Covenant has two optional protocols, which signatories to the broader covenant can decide whether or not to join. The first establishes an individual complaints mechanism, which permits individuals to lodge complaints about violations of the covenant by party states with the Human Rights Committee, which is then empowered to investigate any complaints. To date, 116 of the 174 party states have joined the first optional protocol. The second optional protocol abolishes the death penalty. This protocol has 90 party states. The Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Covenant has just one optional protocol, which empowers the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights to receive and investigate complaints in a manner similar to that of the Human Rights Committee. This protocol currently has only 26 party states, though 46 parties have signed but not yet ratified the optional protocol. Finally, the Civil and Political Rights Treaty places more emphasis on immediate rights that must be realized and protected by states without delay. These rights, which include the right to life, freedom from torture, and freedom from slavery, are also considered non-dirigible, meaning they are absolute rights that cannot be suspended or abridged by states, even in times of war or emergency. The Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights Covenant, by contrast, recognizes that the full realization of the rights afforded by the treaty may take time and resources to realize. Because of this, the covenant recognizes the principle of progressive realization, which means that states are required to take steps to their maximum of their available resources towards the full realization of these rights over time, with the recognition that states will have an immediate obligation to ensure minimum essential levels of these rights are met. While these treaties and the international human rights regime more broadly are globally recognized, they're still nevertheless subject to a wide range of criticisms and critiques on a variety of fronts. One common critique is the challenge posed by cultural relativism, which argues that human rights should be understood and applied in a manner that respects the cultural diversity and varying social norms around the world. Critics argue that universal human rights standards may not align with specific cultural, religious, or traditional practices, and that imposing such standards could undermine cultural autonomy and self-determination. This critique is complemented by the critique that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and its subsidiary covenants are Eurocentric, reflective of Western perspectives and interests, and representing a form of cultural imperialism. This has been particularly reflected in concerns raised by countries like Saudi Arabia and the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which argue that the declaration has a Western and secular bias. In 1990, the organization adopted the Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam, which situates human rights in the context of Islam and emphasizes the importance of Sharia in contextualizing and operationalizing those rights.
Critics of the United Nations human rights system also point to the challenges of implementation of the rights spelled out in the various conventions, particularly in the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. Implementation of human rights obligations at the national level can be challenging, and many countries face resource constraints, political obstacles, or institutional weaknesses that hinder effective realization of human rights. Critics argue that the gap between human rights rhetoric and on-the-ground realities raises doubts about the effectiveness of international human rights law. This limitation is further complicated by the lack of strong and effective enforcement mechanisms to protect human rights. Even where clear international law protecting a specific right exists, international courts and tribunals are often only able to issue opinions and compliance with their decisions is often voluntary. Further, states may have limited resources or limited incentives to hold themselves accountable for human rights violations. This weak enforcement can lead to a perception that human rights standards are ineffective in practice. And even when human rights are enforced, such enforcement actions are often undertaken in an arbitrary or selective manner, with powerful states often escaping accountability for human rights violations, while weaker states are disproportionately targeted. This perceived bias undermines the credibility and legitimacy of the system and raises questions about the consistency of its application. More broadly, the politicization of human rights means that the discourse is often used by powerful states to promote their own interests rather than to protect the rights of individuals. As we consider in another video, for example, the United States has often used human rights as a justification for intervening in the affairs of other countries in pursuit of actions which, upon deeper analysis, are more reflective of national material interests like the pursuit of natural resources rather than the pure protection of human rights in and of themselves. And many states maintain that the principle of sovereignty must also be respected, asserting that the extension of universal human rights and the interventionist nature of their promotion and protection undermines the sovereignty of the state. For such states, human rights considerations should not override the sovereignty of states, and interfering in domestic affairs under the pretext of human rights protection may constitute unwanted or unwarranted foreign interference in violation of the UN Charter. This concern has been exacerbated by the selective use of the Responsibility to Protect Doctrine, which we explore in another video. Finally, the fact that there are ongoing debates and disagreements regarding the inclusion and interpretation of specific rights within the framework of international human rights law suggests that the specific rights guaranteed are still under debate. Issues like the right to self-determination, the right to privacy in a digital age, and the rights of marginalized groups continue to generate differing viewpoints and interpretations. Despite these challenges, international human rights law remains an important tool for protecting the rights of individuals. It has been used to, up, to hold states accountable for human rights abuses, and it has helped to promote the rights of women, children, and minorities. The law is still evolving, and it is likely to face new challenges in the future. However, it remains an important tool for promoting a more just and equitable world. But that's it for now. Please leave any questions you have in the comments section below, and thanks for watching. Bye.